I think uh, we we will open the floor, floor to questions to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, for the question and answer if there's section. Anything. If there's any, and otherwise... Uh, we'll sing. Yeah, but we want some questions, I think, and some engagement, uh, uh, possibly. If people uh, are inspired or challenged by the panel, please uh, raise your hand. And then... I've got two. two. Yeah. They, they went up at the same time. So, Alex, I'm going to... A brilliant panel. Let me, let me start with that. And, and entertaining, too. But I'm going to take, take issue with you, Alex. Ethics, I googled it quickly. Moral principles that govern a person's behaviour or the conducting of an activity, as a, as a definition that came up. I hate ethics boards. I hate ethics forms. I'm on FREC. That's the faculty... Oh, you are too. So you're to blame. Sins. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. I hate yeah. it. But I think it's kind of been ethics has been co-opted by. But for me, ethics comes down to something really simple. What do you stand for? Mm. And uh, social media is a tool that can be like a knife. Yeah, it can be used to cut food and it can be used to kill people. Sure. So I think we do need to have a conversation. I think all of this, ultimately, is actually about ethics. It's about values. It's not my job as an educator to tell you what you should stand for, but perhaps we should be asking that question before we do anything else. What do you stand for? What are the values that guide you? I agree. And how are they evolving? I agree. I think it's just the word for me is a bit barbed, irrespective of the definition, because as far as I'm concerned, especially in academic circles, it's been hijacked by the people with the forms and ticking. If you tick 15 boxes, you deem to be OK. OK, the UK is very good at this, by the way, for instance, as an example. OK, that you fill in the form. It doesn't matter how you fill in the form. If you tick on the boxes, everything is fine. OK, not everything is fine. So I think that's the, that's the thing I'm taking issue. Uh, until uh, somebody, uh, a PhD student dies in Egypt, uh, Sorry. until a PhD student dies in Egypt, yeah. Egypt by the Egyptian government, yeah? And then it's I, not I, fine, I, <laughs> then it's not fine. I, I, I think we've got to find some way of red flags. It's not perfect. The problem I keep on seeing are the platforms. The business model of the platforms remains to scrape every single blessed bit of data. No amount of antitrust laws till now have worked. And if you've got Elon Musk now in charge of Twitter, that's the other interesting thing. Musk said, he says many things, one of the things he said was, I want to defend the public square. Remember all of us old hippies? Information wants to be free. That's what he was saying. That was the flag he's raising. Now, people like some of us are a bit worried about what's going to happen because it's a certain kind of an agenda. No, he was really saying vote Republican, or whatever it was he was saying. He says a different thing every day. I'm just, I just keep on, I think the problem is, while we keep on trusting a, hand, a handful of very powerful social media platforms that are owned, listed somewhere, and TikTok, is TikTok listed somewhere? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you know, made in somewhere else. Like dance, yeah. We have a problem. And no amount of effort still now to come up with a social media platform for the public good, which is not dependent on an advertising model. I haven't seen one which essentially has worked. Maybe the one exception is Wikipedia, maybe, okay? Which has human beings moderating stuff. Kind of, sometimes. I can it's still game it. It's a neutral point of view. Do you, have a, do you have a profile on Wikipedia? No. I don't. You? Somebody made one. Somebody made it for you. Nobody waited for for me, so you can still game it. <laughs> so, Murray, I know it doesn't answer your question, but I, I, I think we need to have a value system. I think that's what we, we will agree on that. We need a value system. I happen to think that the value system has to be happening in the home, in the boardroom, online, everywhere. And I think that's the problem we have at the moment. It's like we, we've got a system where it's very difficult to differentiate, or, or it's in people's interest now to say black is not black and white is not white. It's very easy to keep on repeating the same thing, including winning elections and the rest of it. Okay, that's, that's the problem I have. But uh, uh, perhaps we were brought up in a generation yes. where we were told yes. what ethics we well, should, yeah. you know, that, that's not yes. what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, can, is there the space? To, can we create the space to reclaim ethics, Don't but know. bottom up, let's talk about what we stand for rather than be told what we should or shouldn't 
be standing and, for. And I would add to that, the fact is we've also got engineers and data scientists and all those who are coming together to build these AIS algorithms. Mm -hmm. What are the values that are informing it? Well, and at the moment, we're competing with capitalist values, yeah, Absolutely. which is greed, 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 power, power, power. And they're not deploying their own values, so it's not kind of personal moral ethics. It's actually the ethics of the business through the business strategy because they're told in a project initiation document, this is what you're going to build, this is how you're going to build it, and this is when you're going to have it built by. And so coming back to the need for the corporate governance piece, which participatory ethical governance, the idea of that is, is to bring it into business, but to bring in enough stakeholders so that they're actually getting the views and opinions of people whom this actually impacts and inf influences and, and affects. And then, when you bring them in and they're critical about your business, you don't fire them, because a lot of uh, mm. firing was targeting particular women of colour and so on. Well, this is why they're not em all employees. It's multifaceted, yeah. so some exactly. people will be internal, because as we know, a certain media platform has fired their internal responsible AI <laughs> <Yes>. team. Yeah. <laughs> C can we go uh, to Olia now? I think she was at the same time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let just uh, let me pick up on the ethics. I work with leaders, fem female leaders, who have this ethical decision-making dilemma. Um, they get up in the morning. They are, let's say, single moms. And they have another single mother in their team who is under delivering over a period of time. It in affects entire team, productivity, results, ability to sustain the business in this time of crisis, right? So I'm going to leave this open. I just wanted a moment to comment on this that we need to build bridges from what you are talking about on a, on a large scale, right? And in between, uh, lady spokesman told us, you know, passionately about the, the values that we mentioned and everything. We need to find a way to translate that into this moment in here and now and to help, right, in this, in this situation. And I would just leave it at, at that. And thank you for allowing this you know, conversation even to be open. Thank you. May I respond to that one? Okay. <laughs> so I introduced myself earlier um, as um, a government official working at the U.S. Embassy. That's, of course, my, my, my day job, but my, my main job is also just being a mom. So I have two boys. Your, your question, your point really resonates with me. And it gets back to something that I think is so important. And I'm, I mentioned when I was giving my remarks, but this gives me a chance to mention again that we're humans. When we talk about social media, when we talk about corporations, when we talk about the digital space, it's easy to forget that we're all fundamentally people. All of us have our own challenges that we're dealing with and coping with. It could be the single mother. It could be someone um, worried about an aging parent. It could be someone who just wants more exercise and can't get to the gym or who has a dog that they care about and wants to take for a walk. So it kind of underscores that at the end of the day, we can't forget that human connection. It's easy to talk online, but it can't take the place of engaging face-to-face -face with people and finding out what those real human issues are. Um, I worry as a mother and, of course, as an official, that if we move too far into the digital space, we'll lose that. We'll lose the people-to-people -people connection, and we can't do that. Um, that has to come first. It, it is a shame that they didn't uh, have you earlier in Afghanistan than the time you were there. Uh, it could have been better <laughs> for the multinational force there. Okay. Uh, any more uh, questions? It's an observation. Um, you're speaking here, and I'm actually watching you through the screen. And I wonder, I mean, today when it comes to the internet, I remember before, I remember after, um, the digital aspect has literally disappeared into the background. We have, come, we have become so naturalized towards that we don't think about it. We only miss it when it's not there. 
And I'm not really comfortable when I, you make the distinction between on the screen and face to face. Because today, when it comes to the screen, um, the technology has moved so f far, so, so I mean, it's natural that if I speak to you in person or speak to this screen, I'm still speaking to you face to face. I would prefer, or that's how I feel, that when I'm speaking to someone in real space, not online, I would say in person. But if I'm speaking to you through the screen or in person, I'm still speaking to you face to face. And that is something that I think even the new generation, Gen Z, has become naturalized too. And there's a whole continuum between this 3D reality and the flat reality online, and eventually it's going to get even more profound when we move to virtual reality. So in that case, where would face-to-face -face be? So I, I believe if I'm looking at you, I'm talking to you in person, not just face-to-face. -face. If I'm looking at you to the screen, I'm still speaking to you face-to-face. -face. I don't know. I tend to make that kind of distinction. It's like when we talk about learning. I've had enough hearing about, for instance, technology-enhanced learning. We don't enhance it anymore. We have to mediate through things. It's like when you're cooking curried rice. You don't do the rice and you sprinkle the curry on it and you enhance it. it has, the spice has to be part of the cooking process. You're mediating things to it. You're getting out the flavor. The same with the screen. This is our reality. I mean, if I put my tongue out on the screen, I'm, I'm still get the same feedback. But in person, it's different. So please, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't believe I am. Face to face, in person, or on the screen, it's still face to face now. Pat it's Patrick, different than it was in 1999. I have a question. So yeah. are you talking about the whole performance bit? Are Everything. we talking about that these guys, Gen Z, yes. right? who were born, unlike us, right? I was definitely born in black and white. I can't even find pictures of myself. Exactly, when I was a that's kid. why you can speak but the difference. But these guys were born with somebody taking a picture of them as soon as they were born. So are you saying that they were born performing to a screen and it comes naturally, and it doesn't come naturally to my generation? No. Okay, so it's- They're that's, quite natural that's, towards it. That's the point. So I when, when I die, right? When I die, when we die, yeah? So, so are we just gonna go around with these things in front of our, Heads. I mean, I know it's and Probably maybe they'll become maybe, smaller, maybe the metaverse is that's where it's going, right? That it's you can be here, but I can be in Rio. No, I met somebody from Brazil, and I said, "Well, I went to Rio once." Yeah, and I, I and it, it it does seem to be that we're at this tipping point at the moment. No, most people now would be bored. Now, the first thing you'd be doing is looking at your screen. No, like the girl with Asperger's was looking at the screen. I mean, I work and a lot I, and with I Gen made Z's. certain wrong assumptions. I, I do work a lot with Gen Zs, and mm. the, they make that distinction. I mean, if I'm speaking them to this screen, I mean, I have lot, many dissertation students, I never really meet in person. Mm. But they still get very good grades. And it's not the first time that I'm driving and I'm speaking to them through WhatsApp. You know? And I'm still speaking there face to face. I'm very happy about your optimism. I <laughs> honestly am. It's called the, the techno-utopian uh, uh, illusion. And it's a reality, uh, not an illusion. I'm very yeah. happy for you. I wanted, if I may, uh, uh, abuse my chair privilege uh, to ask you, uh, I wanted to ask you, when you build the coalition, and then this went to the Daily Mail and so on mm -hmm. and so forth, yeah. uh, did you have an antagonistic, uh, an antagonist on the other side on social media or somewhere else um, that you had to battle with online? Was there a backlash from, uh, I don't know, actors like um, that were saying, uh, oh, here's the feminist again. Did you have uh, saying that you're a bot, that you yeah. were something else? That mm -hmm. were, what was that experience? Because it's very interesting. Uh, yeah. So with this campaign, we didn't. The main, the, the counter narrative to this campaign was, well, if you don't like Love Island, you shouldn't be stupid enough to watch it, <laughs> which I felt was just so dismissive. It's, there's a lot of class-based assumptions in that. And there's also a real um, 
devaluing of pop culture when actually pop culture is how we share intelligence. Pop culture is how we navigate the world. Pop culture is the subject of most conversations we have, whether we like it or not. We don't have these high and mighty navel-gazing ethical conversations every day. We often talk about, oh, celebrity gossip. This musician said this. What's this on? What, have you heard this about this film premiere? Like, this is how we navigate the world, and that's why when I talk about our football campaign, it becomes very different because actually when you are challenging, you know, violent and abusive men who have a lot of power in society and money and the huge like, fortress around football, which is business, that's when we got very interesting opposition because actually, you know, when it came to the Love Island campaign, ultimately it, there was like a, a faceless corporation and it was like ITV are being ir irresponsible. It's... There's no argument against it. You know you're bad. Take the ads down. Done. Um, however, when we have challenged football teams, football players, the Premier League, that is when we have come up against institutional silence, mm. um, which is why we end up flying football planes over the pitches, because <laughs> otherwise you're locked out. Unless you physically get on the pitch, they will just leave you out of it. Um, and football fans, and wow, football fan Twitter is the wild west. <laughs> um, and I think what's, what's very interesting um, around that, I mean, we, we had so much abuse. Like, we had so many horrible messages, horrible, horrible messages from bots, from Man United football fans, from Ronaldo fans, you know. And I think we really have to ask ourselves the question why um, psychologically people feel so invested in these figures of masculinity that they will really, like, abuse a stranger on the internet that they have more in common with than a multi-millionaire football player um, because they obviously identify more with that. So to go back to your question in terms of like the online abuse and the backlash we faced, it's, it's only ever when we're really, really challenging serious power in society and serious power around social norms, sexual norms, um, especially coming off the back of, you know, lots of public debates around Me Too, there is just a lot of, you know, men's rights activists, incel narratives, where they live in these online communities called the Manosphere, and they l hate feminists. Um, and, and they take a lot of pleasure in sending rape threats, in saying horrendous things, in sending death threats to, to any woman who's speaking out. So I think when it comes to conversations around kind of ethics and social media, like the, I think the question is, it's not is life on a screen bad or worse than face-to-face -face conversation? It's how do abuses of power take a different form? Because we're not going to stop screen life. We're not going to stop social media. We're not going to stop surveillance capitalism. But I don't maybe think we can stop reproducing the same... The, mm. the, well, it's amplified forms mm. of violence. It's, mm. It takes on a different form. And I think for me, like, feminism and also, I guess, regulation is about power relations and how you mitigate harm in society through kind of shifting power relations. Um, but I think the biggest question is the same online and offline, which is how do we reshape power relations in society so women stop being murdered, um, so people of colour are not facing horrific systemic you know, racist capitalist violence, and how do we look ourselves in the mirror and recognise how many of us are a part of the problem, honestly? And that's the point of participatory governance. It's about bringing power to account, mm. firstly, mm. and secondly, collaboration, because the most mm. powerful thing you did, particularly with the Love Island, mm. and I, I could see, obviously, there would be other collaborators with the football mm. challenging with the rapist piece, you know, is collaboration and collaborating mm. those voices. And that's where the participatory bit brings in different voices, different expertise to amplify and build mm. up the case uh, dare I say, a case for ethics, but a mm. case um, against what you, you're challenging that power for. Mm. And I think the one powerful, other powerful thing you mentioned was about the lockout, the digital lockout, there's digital exclusion. So we mentioned about this on life, Karen mentioned earlier on about this on life that we all apparently are in now, and it's done something to us in the way that we're operating as human beings now, both in digital and in real life, IRL. Mm. And... That, that's changed things, but can you imagine if you don't have access to a computer, if you don't have access to a smartphone, if you don't have access to a, a VR, AR headset in the future, you are going to be digitally locked out, and we need to challenge that power before it becomes a power play in and of itself. 
That is a very good note. There is a question. Did you have a question or you were like, yeah, okay, you do, sorry. Because sometimes people just go like this and you don't know what it yeah, is. Alex. Okay, um, so you've talked a lot about ethics, for example, which are obviously based on, um, how do I say, collective shared morals. Mm. And yet, I don't think we've ever been more polarized in the history of our civilization mm. um, on the subject of what it means to be Western, what it means to, how do I say, um, what it means to form part of our civilization. For example, the United States is the perfect example of that. You have people who, you have two camps right now who are interpreting the vaguely written American constitution, if you'll forgive me, um, what's it called, very, very differently. And I'm very convinced as a member of Gen Z that this dispute will turn violent in our time. I'm very, very convinced of it. I have a lot of friends of mine who are extremely right wing. I've developed a method of trying to, how do I say, de-radicalize them. I'm gonna share it with you. Um, in his Pulitzer Prize winning uh, anthropological work, The Denial of Death, Ernest Becker talks about how, um, how do I say, how, um, how um, shared, what he called hero systems, right? Which are basically just shared constructs and shared um, value principles and obviously shared collective goals because this is what we're missing, um, are all actually constructed to take away our fear of death. And if I come and I challenge what you deem to be objectively right, mm. um, and you take that as a personal attack, you are pretty much actually just admitting that you don't have the monopoly on what it means to be here in the first place. Mm. So my question is, if you're going to come at this from a, from a regulatory standpoint and you want to manage platforms and you want to kind of say, okay, you know, we're gonna filter out the bad content from the good, Where's the criteria? How do you convince someone, for example, on the other side of the political spectrum, objectively, yeah. that what they're saying is wrong? Because in my opinion, you can't. Yeah. We don't have the monopoly on the objective truth. Uh, in my personal uh, experience, when I meet someone who's extremely polarized, both left or right, the easiest way to just have a rational conversation with them is to not feel personally attacked. If you feel personally attacked, uh, the the entire debate becomes personal. But as someone who's grown up on social media, uh, as someone who's left social media, I'm one of the few Gen Zers that has absolutely no social media left. I've left it. And I've left it because human beings, especially when I talk to feminists, for example, there's a lot of talk about objectification. And I find it really interesting because humans naturally objectify each other. Um, we're objectifying each other right now. You form a perception about me and I will do the same about you. But this has been scaled up. So in the time when Alex was my age, for example, society was what Alex made of it, right? Today's society is made out to be objective and the way that we communicate today is based on this objectivity that you know, there, there's these groups, I can physically see them, I can join them, I can maybe uh, be not allowed access to them, right? And my question to the entire panel is, do we really have a future objectively online and in a world of digital constructs where polarization isn't a thing unless we do figure out what it means to be part of our civilization. Because if we don't, uh, as a historian, I can tell you very, very confidently things will get very violent. Uh, I come from Russia. After 1991, we lost our, uh, how do I say, shared uh, direction of where to go. And I can tell you very, very quickly that the uh, elites in society are not ideological. They are economically motivated and they will put their chips on the best horse. And uh, unfortunately, the way things are going now, the right seems to be a lot more homogenous than the left in what they believe. Because the right seems to kind of see things as a power struggle against those who challenge the uh, inherent value systems that have been around for a very long time. And I genuinely fear that things will turn violent by the time maybe I'm Alex's age, for example, because we don't have any solution to this. We, we, we talk about regular and you know doing this and doing that and yet we're very stuck in our own bubble in fact this entire panel to some extent is one big echo chamber this entire conference is one big echo mm. chamber uh, and I'm not in any way disagreeing with anything you're saying I'm just mm. saying for example in the context of the United States you guys aren't having an open conversation I'm really sorry to say like it's it's not open enough because you have to understand like look at how the electorates have changed for both left and right the proletariat well not proletariat I'm being a bit too Marxist um, the uh, working class is now voting right whereas 40 50 years ago that was a con consistent left-wing kind of voter base. And why has that happened? It's because we're undermining um, what's it called value systems and things that have in, you know, inherently made us who we are. We've started deconstructing them. We've gone as far as things like gender, for example, but, which is good. But, but also uh, that has been exploited. Of course. Uh, in the sense of uh, 
the, the point of targeting people, right, on Facebook or anywhere, you target undecided voters, not the ones that have already decided it, right? So in that context, when you have uh, disinformation campaigns, and of course it's not only Russia that has done that, everybody and their mom has done that, <laughs> including actors you have no idea that they would do it in, in a sense, right? So it, uh, you have a context that is about, as you say, structural conditions, materiality, and then you have actors that take advantage of the polarization and they want to amplify the polarization, right? So in the context of Brexit, this happened uh, with campaigns, vote leave, be leave campaigns, an illegal campaign that was actually fined uh, because uh, the Electoral Commission found that they spent more than seven million pounds and they fined them. But, but the work that they were doing, there were a couple of kids that didn't even know who they were working for, basically, and the whistleblowing of Christopher, well, the Gebris analytical scandal, the funding, the relationships around that. So you have a context, a structural context. The problem is that with the pandemic, you had the digital by default. And the element in the structure that was the digital became a core element in the structure. So this is why uh, we are going as fast as we are, because whatever should have happened in a decade happened in three months because of the pandemic. But the inherent problems before the pandemic have amplified to the extent that you are talking about and, and uh, the war uh, with Ukraine and what is happening right now is also, in my opinion, uh, has a, a significant relevance that there is an influence of what is happening on, uh, on the digital than ever before, and that happened because of the pandemic. So I'm not saying that any platform caused the war, obviously not, right? But I'm saying that uh, the fact that the digital came in the center stage of the structural uh, context is uh, a big problem. But it's not that the working class person in the United States is disillusioned false consciousness, to put it in the Marxist Lukacian sense, right? Uh, I think it's more than that, that when you have a, a certain uh, situation that the gaps and the gray areas and what falls in the cracks, if it's taken advantage of, and the motive could be economic, but the motive could be very political. So I don't think that the Russian elite has only economic motives, right? So I think, can I just respond to the, the thing that you said early on, actually? Um, two things. I think when you talk about polarization and kind of this this fear of violence, I feel like because of the increasing aggressiveness and isolation of capitalism and a climate crisis that is happening, I think increasingly people are just seeking safety, belonging and community. I think mm -hmm. we're very, very isolated. I think COVID has been so destructive for so many people. And I think actually underneath, underneath all of this, I don't think anyone ever genuinely has bad intentions. I think people are desperately seeking a space of safety and belonging, and that's why things are becoming so, so heightened, because people are feeling more unsafe because the world is feeling more unsafe, whether that's the pandemic, whether that's impending complete climate disaster. Um, I also think the question of violence is really interesting, and I wonder, like, violence has been happening for years, and, like, violence is happening all the time, and violence against women and people of colour is, you know, is a part of daily life, and I wonder if the question around is, um, will the world become more violent, is will the world become more violent against the dominant majority? Will the world become more violence, violent for white men? Um, I wonder if that's part of what the question is, because I think the world is inherently violent. I mean, my presentation here tomorrow is about the fact that in the UK, a woman is murdered by her partner every three days, and yet every time it's reported, it's like it's, it's come out of the blue. So I think systemic violence um, is around us, and when it comes to kind of abstract debates around moral ob objectivity or objective truth, you just have to look at how power relations work and actually how much harm is physically being enacted and who is on the receiving end of that harm and who is not. So I can speak from the UK context, um, you know, police violence, for example, against black and brown communities, especially black people in the UK, it's the clearest indication of systemic racism. I think there's a lot of people in the UK who would like to debate whether 
the UK is still racist, and of course it is. The, Look at the statistics. The gaslighting with the sewer report that there is no institutional racism. Oh yeah, completely. The, but the gaslighting of the of major proportions that there is no institutional racism in the UK. The report that, yeah. that took out this government that is not happening. So, uh, but it's like beyond the conjecture. Who is being killed? How, how often are they being killed? Whose lives are more important? The COVID pandemic showed us that more clearly than anything else. And I think that is where we have to orient our moral compass and that is where we really have to look at ourselves. And as the American <laughs> um, on the panel today, thank you for your comments and your questions. And that's fundamentally what this is about. Um, I don't come, I don't think that our government comes to always communicate a point. Part of communication is listening. And that's the only way we can get out of this, this echo chamber that you're talking about. Um, it's no secret that there were midterm elections in the United States this week, um, incredibly um, scrutinized internationally. I can understand your concerns for violence at some point in the future, but I, I think there are a lot of indications that things are working too. I mean, Americans went to the polls, they voted safely. You know, democracy is hard work. It takes a lot of people to make it happen, whether it's setting up the polls, monitoring, um, you have election observers, counting. I mean, there are so many steps involved in that process and it worked. So. I, know, I guess maybe I choose to be an optimist, um, but just so you know, I was really glad to hear your comments. You feel free to find me after this and, and challenge me some more. That's why I come to these events. So, so just, to f just to finalize, um, you all made really good points. I just want to ask, like, how do we just repair this kind of divided consensus on, you know, what's the path forward, what progress really means? Because this is this is one of the biggest questions that we all face today. Like, no one, no one really, no, no one on either side really can, you know, come forward and say, you know, this is what the world's going to look like in a hundred years anymore. And that, as you mentioned, it could be climate change, it could be systemic disagreement on, you know, what values are, for example, in the police and. You know how, how uh, for example, they interact with civil society. Um, what's it called? The, uh, the role of w and treatment of women in society. These are all really good points. But the the underlying issue is like when I have to go back and you know talk to a bunch of incels and try to kind of make them see reason. Bring me. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the the, pro the problem is that True. would become a very heated argument really quick. I don't want to come. I'm joking. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what's it called? Um, how do you how uh, how do you kind of fill this void that's been filled with uh, that's been kind of created by the decline of uh, you know collected? Uh, how, uh, okay, I was trying to avoid it, but the decline of Judeo-Christian value systems because they we we have become a slowly more secular culture. The thing is, the rate at which that's been happening is starting to see we're starting to see the the results of that. And although I'm not here to advocate for theological dogma to be reintroduced as like... You, you're, you're now really going into... Wading yeah, 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 yeah. You're wading deep. I'm going into, deep. Yeah, um, so... I'm, 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 I'm zizeking. Um, <laughs> uh, how, uh, how do we kind of... How do we come together and how do we, um, again, find a collective goal again? Like, what are we going to base that on if it isn't going to be theological dogma? Wait, what's I would the like question to say... about... But what's the Judeo-Christian... Are you <laughs> suggesting that people who don't ascribe to Judeo-Christian... What are you saying, sorry? I mean... <laughs> yeah! <laughs> um, I would just like to say that fundamentally, as a globe, I think we all need to have an open conversation about finding a moral compass. Absolutely. Quite, quite frankly. Because who's ethic? How is it being deployed? When, where, why? For what purpose? And is it just all about the money? Of course. And I think um, I recommend a book that will be coming out in 2023 called The Digital Public Square. Okay. That talks about... It's, I, I contributed to it. I didn't write it by a guy called Jason Thacker. And um, it will be about, you know, raising up the next generation of public civics to, you know, not just be consumers, but producers in a society that we all want. I don't think there'll ever be consensus, um, but my vision of a liberated society is where everybody is free from bodily and systemic violence, and my moral compass will always fall with that as my orientation. Okay. 
On that note, I think we're going to wrap up here unless uh, uh, there's an urgent... Uh, no, Alex no, I don't think there's any urgent thing. And I think we're about to wrap up on time. And I'm, I'm very, very aware of the fact that it's like gone dark, right? And I really wanted to end today with something really upbeat. Um, but the one point I want to make, this is about conversations. It's not totally an echo chamber here because you will find it. You were speaking and I could see you quickly know that you know, not everybody's going to agree with each other. I think it's important to have these conversations. I think it's important to have these conversations in different cultures and different contexts. And I think that's what I'm particularly keen on having now, that if we start something here, it might well go to Sweden, might well go to Jordan, might well I think these conversations. And I think it's also, I'm really looking forward to the day when, yes, the oldies aren't involved in the conversations. Um, having said that, it's, it's, we're at an interesting moment, I, I, I feel. And also conflict uh, produces knowledge. Absolutely. After a point, after a Absolute, point, no. Absolutely. But after a point, we need conflict absolutely. and uh, debate, yeah. Absolutely. So, on that basis, now, I have... Um, and again, we're going to get off the stage, and I don't... Mario, can you, can, you fi can you see if the next lot have finished? So I can drag as many... Of you. Yeah, just tell them the time frame. So the story behind this, and you're going to find these guys lurking in the background. There's Yup over there. Where's Diane? Yeah. So the story now is very different. Maybe lighter, maybe whatever it is, okay? I used to teach these guys. They were Erasmus students three years ago. I had no idea who they were. I just knew that they were hanging around always together. You know, you kind of have a mental block. They always sat together. I didn't know what they were doing. But towards, like, when they were about, like, at the end, I vaguely realized that they were doing these videos of, like, running around Malta and then... And then they went off somewhere else. And then I started following their adventures all around Europe. And then you picked up a dog somewhere in Italy. And then I found <laughs> them in Spain. And, I, and we had this discussion, as um, Jeanette and I. Because the other thing we have to be looking at is, that, you know, this influencers thing? Everybody wants to be an influencer, which for me, whenever I used to teach, I remember a Swedish girl telling me, every single time you mention the word influencer, you wrinkle your nose as if it's like, you know, something really <laughs> dark and dank. And, and, and I, I remember saying, probably it's something equally stupid. And I said, because I, I, I associate being influential with that kind of behavior. And, um, and it got us into some very dark places. So I really wanted to get these two guys to talk about what they're doing as Gen Z with the medium that they have to maybe have the kind of life that they have, which I couldn't have in my life. Because when I was their age, all, I was trapped on this island and all I could think of was looking at the horizon and escape. And it took me till 23 till I could escape. Okay, so that's why I wanted to end with something quite positive. We can, okay?